Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, today's Magic Mushroom Day. So we are here to celebrate. Hi, everyone. I'm going to let a few people join before we start. Hi. My name is Macy Baker. I'm the content lead at Field Trip Health and Wellness taking over an Instagram Live today for Conrad, our Director of Growth, giving him a little break. Hi. Hi, Kev Burns. Hi. So, um, as we detailed in our story yesterday, today is Magic Mushroom Day. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit about that before I add our lovely special guest. Um, so the holiday is pretty new. It only started in um, 2015, and most people are accustomed to 420 being the day of cannabis. And today it is the day for psilocybin mushrooms, um, 920. So it started, like I said, in 2015 by a magic mushroom advocate named Nicholas Reville. Um, and he just called it today an educational day of action, which I think is really great. It's nice and somebody um, started this movement and people around the world are really excited about it. I think psilocybin deserves its own day. So here we are. Um, yeah, so today is all about bringing awareness to the powerful properties of psilocybin and how this plant medicine, when used in the right set and setting, can be tremendously healing. Um, we're really excited about where the legalization of psilocybin is going um, for medicinal purposes. And we'll talk today about all the things we're doing here at Field Trip um, around these substances. So that is the day, um, and we're really excited. I'm going to see if our director of research is ready to join us. Um, give me just one second. Okay, sent him the invite. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, if you all have any questions about psilocybin, about what we're doing a field trip with psilocybin, what's legal now, what's not, um, drop your comments and we will try to get to your questions at the end of this. Marshall, hey. Hey. Thanks for joining. Yeah, of course. How are you doing today? Doing pretty well. How about you? Well, it's good. I'm in sunny Austin and excited to uh, chat with you all things mushrooms. Yeah, likewise. You're in California, right? Yeah, yeah, in California, Northern California, enjoying Beautiful. some sun too. <laughs> Love it. We're both in sunny places today. <laughs> yeah, fortunate for sure. So I want to give you a little intro before we start, just so everybody knows who you are. Marshall is our in-house mushroom man, Marshall the Mushroom Man. Um, he does a variety of things, but he is our director of research here at Field Trip Health and Wellness. Um, he's a scientist with a passion for psychoactive molecules and the organisms that produce them. We are super lucky to have him on our team. He is just filled with knowledge and passion for these substances. And he's been with us for a really long time. So super grateful to have you, Marshall. Um, and we have a lot to talk about today in terms of what you're working on and, and where the world of mushrooms is going. Um, so I could just start off with really baseline information to ask you, what the heck is psilocybin and where does it come from? <laughs> yeah, so those are big questions. And I think, I mean, the first one um, is easier to answer than the second. So psilocybin okay. is a small molecule um, for phosphoryloxy dimethyltryptamine. So it's related to dimethyltryptamine. It just has an extra little phosphate group coming off one of its carbon atoms. Um, and as we, as many of us probably know, it has these profound psychoactive effects when it's metabolized in the human body. Um, and it's produced by a host of different fungi. So it's produced by over a hundred different species of psychoactive fungi. And it's still an open question as to why they're making it. So that's been sort of a hot area of research recently is why are these fungi making this molecule? In all likelihood, it's not for us. A lot of people like to think, 
oh, psilocybin's being made for us so we can have these profound psychedelic experiences. Um, but in reality, it probably serves some sort of anti-predation mechanism or potentially as an attractant mm -hmm. for insects um, to help spread spores. So either it's a deterrent, an attractant, or some sort of uh, combination of both because a lot of these insects that are feeding on fungi do contain similar receptors, serotonin-type receptors that the molecule would act on. Um, so it's possible that it does have some sort of appetite suppressant effect or memory effects, but all of that is still being uncovered, and so it's a pretty complex interaction in all likelihood. Wow, interesting. So plants, or I'm sorry, not plants, but insects and animals can be ingesting these fungi and i'm wondering what's happening psychoactively to them versus what happens in humans yeah for sure i mean it's so hard to know right if only you could ask yeah. the insects what are you a feeling right or... now when... yeah, yeah yeah exactly it's hard to imagine that they're having this sort of profound psychedelic experiences that that we're having but it's again impossible to know because we don't really communicate on the same level that they communicate so they definitely yeah is some effect of the psilocybin because they do contain these receptors that are responsive to it, but we don't know exactly what that effect is. Interesting. Are there any studies happening like around animals and, and psilocybin? I mean, I know like animal testing is, is definitely a thumbs down in a lot of cases, but just curious if that's even being studied or looked at. Yeah, so I mean, as far as I know, some researchers have tried to feed insect psilocybin basically to, to try to see what happens. I think it has some appetite suppressing effects in fruit flies. And so that's sort of where the logic goes is that, okay, maybe insects are trying to feed, the psilocybin suppresses their appetite, and so they no longer want to feed and so protects the mycelium and, and the mushroom. Um, so that's a definite possibility. But the issue is I don't think there's much field work that's been done where people have just observed these mushrooms in the wild to see what insects are feeding on them and what sort of effects it's having on the insects that are actually natural predators, not fruit flies, but mm -hmm. which are a model organism in a laboratory setting, but actually in the wild, all of these other uh, hosts of different insects that are potentially feeding on them. Amazing. And psilocybin producing fungi are they found all throughout the world and is there like a concentrated area that like a ton of them are is it kind of just omnipresent that's a great question yeah they're found pretty much everywhere they're most well documented um as far as i know in mexico and hmm. that's largely because some great researchers have taken the time to actually go and look at all these different mushrooms and identify different psilocybin producing species and also document how they're used by different groups in Mexico because they have a long history of traditional indigenous use in that country. It's possible that huge amounts of species exist elsewhere too. I mean, we know there's a lot in the US, for example, there's a lot throughout Europe. It's just these places haven't been quite as well documented as, and explored as Mexico. So, I mean, we're constantly uncovering new species of psilocybin mm -hmm. producing fungi. And I think we'll continue to uncover it more and more as more and more people get interested in mycology. Yeah. yeah, incredible. It really is insane. And speaking of insane, can you give us just like a an overview about how extraordinary mycelium is and, you know, how far back it goes, like back to the ice age and just like the role it has in the Earth's evolution? Yeah, <laughs> those are big questions. I mean, mycelium, um, not just psilocybin producing mycelium, but mycelium itself is, you know, hundreds of millions of years old. I think the first mushrooms are at least, you know, two or 300 million years old. Um, psilocybin seems to have emerged probably between 30 and 50 million years ago. Uh, and since then has diversified quite rapidly, meaning that it's spread between different species. And it has this actually really unique way of spreading. So the genes that are uh, producing psilocybin or the genes that allow the organism to produce psilocybin are not just inherited vertically. So it's not just like a parent to offspring, but mm -hmm. they can also be transferred horizontally between different species. So it's as though say I had a trait that was really beneficial, I could just pass it off to you and you could immediately have oh. that trait yourself. So fungi can somehow do that, which is really cool. And psilocybin must be a pretty valuable molecule because we find that they are doing it. And a lot of this work has been done 
um, for, for everyone viewing right now, I highly recommend you look at Jason Slot's work at Ohio State University. He's done a lot of great work on the evolution of psilocybin and psilocybin producing fungi and identified this sort of horizontal gene transfer mechanism. Amazing. All right, I wrote that down. I'll look myself. Um, yeah, I remember watching the documentary Fantastic Fungi and being forever changed by the information about mycelium and how long it's been around and just like the importance in, in the way it operates with Earth and humans and how far down in the Earth's crust it goes to. Like, it's like miles underneath us, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess there are miles and miles of mycelium under each footstep just because it's so, you know, it's weaving through everything. <laughs> yeah, mind-blowing. <laughs> so cool. Um, okay, so now that we have a baseline on understanding, how does psilocybin affect the brain? Yeah, so that's something that's maybe one of the harder topics of research. In Jamaica, we're mostly working with the organisms, so we're less interested in the direct effects on the brain. But to give uh, a high-level overview of how that works, basically when you consume psilocybin, um, psilocybin itself isn't actually the psychoactive molecule. Your body will break it down into a molecule known as psilocin or psilocin. And that basically is psilocybin without the phosphate group. So instead of a phosphate group, it's got a hydroxyl group or a, an alcohol group on one of these carbon atoms. And so that molecule is what binds to the serotonin receptors in our brain. And the one that seems to be most responsible for the psychoactive effects is the serotonin receptor known as the 5-HT2A receptor. So psilocin will bind to that receptor and activate all sorts of uh, different genes and then you get an, an interesting experience, as any of us who have tried psilocybin will know. Um, and that's still sort of being worked out exactly how different parts of the brain are communicating under the influence of psilocybin. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a pretty complex area. But the general understanding is that it's activating through these serotonin receptors and influencing gene expression in a way that's allowing us to have these profound psychedelic experiences. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, so in terms of brain science, then, you know, as you know, and as many of you who are watching know, at Field Trip, we primarily work with ketamine, which works on glutamate and other neurotransmitters. Um, so how does psilocybin um, differ from ketamine in that way? And second part to the question is, how can we use psilocybin medicinally for therapeutic purposes? And, and why would somebody want to use psilocybin for therapeutic purposes? Yeah, so as you said, uh, ketamine acts through glutamate receptors, so specifically it's antagonizing NMDA receptors. So these are receptors in the brain that normally respond to glutamate, and ketamine will bind to them and block them so they're no longer responsive to glutamate. Psilocybin, or psilocin, the molecule it's metabolized to, has a totally different mechanism uh, in that it binds to serotonin receptors, but they do have interesting overlap and sort of downstream effects. So they tend to cause regionally specific increases in glutamate release. So certain neurons will release more glutamate and you get this sort of hyperplastic effect. So after mm -hmm. taking ketamine or psilocybin, your brain seems to be hyper responsive to, um, to stimuli in the environment and to these sort of relearning processes that we've been finding are so helpful for people who are suffering from conditions like depression and PTSD. So both ketamine and psilocybin do have that capacity to really open up the brain to this kind of rewiring and these neuroplastic learning effects that are really beneficial. Um, and yeah, they can both be used there. A huge component of their therapeutic use is um, their use in conjunction with psychotherapy. And so like how we give ketamine with psychotherapy in the form of ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, Psilocybin is also generally given in the form of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, or if you look at its traditional indigenous use, it's had a lot of context around the experience itself. So it's not just people taking mushrooms at home and having this experience, although that's perfectly you know, acceptable in the right context, but there's a lot of um, support around that sort of experience that seems to be helpful for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, as we say at Field Trip a lot, you know, the preparation and integration therapy aspects um, are 
just as if not more important than the actual medicine experience itself. So um, it's exciting that psilocybin is able to be used in that way. And as you know, and a lot of you um, are with us in kind of holding the torch and, you know, carrying on and, and making sure that we could use psilocybin a as a medicine. So it's pretty exciting. Um, that being said, and many of you may or may not know, but we actually are able to work with mushrooms in our Amsterdam clinic. Um, it's the only one of the 12 field trip health centers that we're able to um, use mushrooms. So Marshall, in, in that regard, that it's much different than a ketamine experience because ketamine experience is, you know, 45 minutes to, to an hour, um, roughly. So how does the dosing work um, for psilocybin in a therapeutic aspect? And, and how long is the journey? Because I know it's significantly different. Yeah, and it does vary a lot between people, too. So it's hard to mm -hmm. give, you know, a rule of thumb. But psilocybin experiences do tend to last about six to eight hours, so substantially longer than the ketamine experiences that we're seeing in our clinics. Um, and we are really careful about dose. So that's one of the, the first things we did when we opened that clinic in the Netherlands was, okay, how are we gonna properly dose these? Because a lot of people were selling what are known as magic truffles. This is the underground part of the fungus. It's sort of these hardened mycelial masses. They look and taste a little bit like nuts or have at least the texture of, of nuts. Mm -hmm. um, but they contain quite a bit of psilocybin. And so, we want to know exactly how much they contain because we need to know how much of the active molecules are in there in order to give an appropriate dose. And we wanted to give a high enough dose, but we didn't want to way overshoot it and have these experiences that could cause more anxiety and, and do more harm than good potentially. And so we actually analyze every single batch of these uh, magic truffles that we're giving to our clients over in the Netherlands. And we make sure that we understand what the psilocybin content is, what the psilocin content is, and we're mm -hmm. even looking at a host of other tryptamines that are related to those two molecules. And we try to aim for a dose that's really similar to what's been shown to be so effective in the ongoing trials. So that's around 25 to 30 milligrams of psilocybin. Okay. Um, and so depending on the batch of uh, magic truffles, that might vary. So some batches are going to be more potent than others. And so we adjust the dose accordingly, which is really important for us to make sure we've got consistency in that experience. So we're not um, under overdosing. Interesting. Okay. So how does our dosing compare to like, you know, how, how people are self-medicating, you know, like they say, an eighth of a gram is like considered a really healthy dose or like a microdose is like 0.1. Um, like where does it live in terms of like how people usually see the dosing of, of magic mushrooms? Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a high dose. Um, mm -hmm. So with magic mushrooms, most people are consuming one species known as Psilocybe cubensis. So if you're buying mushrooms from someone else, generally that's the species that you're consuming and the potency of those mushrooms vary quite a bit, um, but they're generally somewhere around 0.5 to 1% of the dry mass is psilocybin, meaning that, the dose that we're giving in the Netherlands is somewhere between three and five grams of, um, of mushrooms. So that's pretty heroic. <laughs> yeah. So it's a pretty, yeah. it's a pretty large dose. And we find that like those doses that induce those really profound psychedelic experiences tend to be the most helpful. And if you're yeah. doing it in a really supportive environment, the chances for that experience to go awry are definitely minimized. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we definitely are trying to get, we're, we're maximizing and embracing the psychedelic side of the molecules. We're not trying to give such a small dose that people barely feel it. We're really pushing the, the psychedelic dose where people have these transformative experiences. Yeah, it's a way to do it. Um, and in terms of um, the administering in Amsterdam, how, how is it actually given to our clients? Yeah, so they have the option uh, to either consume them straight up or to make a, a tea out of them. So it depends on nice. individual client preferences. Some people prefer chewing the whole sclerotion. Some people prefer them brewed into something to make it a little yeah. more palatable. Just a little, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so my next question then, we know we could legally use it in Amsterdam, but in terms of the legalization in North America, um, where are we currently? Yes, yeah, so it's kind of all over the place. There's a bunch of these grassroots movements that are coming up and in a lot of cities around the country. 
um, all entheogenic plants and fungi have been decriminalized, meaning there's no legal market for them. So you can't just go to a shop and buy them. Uh, but you won't get penalized for growing them or giving them mm -hmm. to a friend as a gift um, or collecting them out in the wild in those cities where it's been decriminalized. And so that, uh, that I think, is, you know, really beneficial because it allows people to access their own without fear of uh, yeah. prosecution. And so we're definitely supportive of that. And then in certain states uh, right now, Oregon being sort of the leader on this front, psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy is legalized and will go live uh, starting next year in January if, if all goes to plan. Um, and so in that sort of context, it won't be like cannabis where you can just walk in to a shop, like a dispensary, and buy some mushrooms and take them home. Mm -hmm. You'll have to take the mushrooms in a designated service center, so a licensed service center, and it's limited to one species. So they've tried to play it really safe and limited it to the most common species of mushroom mm -hmm. um, that can be used and, and sold in that market. And yeah, it remains to be seen how, how that will play because it's sort of a, yeah. it's like a pseudo medical framework because they're administering it like you would in a medical setting with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, but you don't need a medical diagnosis to access it. So if you mm -hmm. just want to use these for spiritual growth, you'll have the option to do that, the opportunity to do that in Oregon uh, when it goes live. <laughs> Pretty exciting. Do we know when that is? January, hopefully. I think that's when they start giving out licenses and hopefully there are no big issues that um, extend that. But that's the plan as far as I'm aware. Interesting. Okay. And like, what do you think about where we're going? Like, do you feel hopeful about the legalization in North America? Um, do you think it'll be medicinal first and then you know recreational second kind of like how cannabis rolled out or, or what's your prediction i think i mean everything's looking positive again with all the cities that are decriminalizing it i think that's the most important thing is to immediately remove criminal penalties for people mm -hmm. who are using these because it really doesn't seem to help anyone to to criminalize these substances and the organisms that produce them um, and so that movement's really strong and I think has a lot of broad, broad spectrum support um, mm -hmm. and, and hopefully continues to grow. And then as far as legalization, I think, yes, states will come on board like they did with cannabis and it's just going to follow if, if Oregon sets a good precedent or a reasonable precedent, you know, each state will adopt their own subtle variation of that precedent. And, and yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really hopeful and hopefully it's not restricted to medical use. I don't, yeah. think, um, I don't think that's a net benefit because there are a lot of people who could tremendously benefit from these experiences who aren't necessarily suffering from a, a medical diagnosis. And so yeah. yeah, I'm hoping it's a more broad spectrum legalization than strict medical use. And I think it will be, um, but it'll yeah. take some time. Yeah, I mean, relevant to field trip, um, do you know, like, what efforts are being made to legalize this in a therapeutic setting? Um, like, you know, just what, what's happening to kind of champion that and move it along? Yeah, so, I mean, at Field Trip, we're really supportive of championing, championing that. And we've got, I mean, all our clinics where we're administering ketamine in the form of ketamine-assisted psychotherapy because ketamine is legal to be administered in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and what we hope to show is that any of these psychedelic molecules really could plug into that sort of framework, you know, all with their little nuances and they might require slightly different protocols and whatnot, but they're all really conducive to inducing these psychedelic experiences and then in conjunction with psychotherapy to actually helping people tremendously. Um, and so I don't think it's, I don't think you can really overstate the beneficial effects of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and we're, we're huge proponents of that. And yeah. I think that in itself showing that, look, if we treat these molecules as psychedelic, it's really embrace the experience, the whole experience, not just the biochemical nature of the molecules, but um, this experiential aspect, I think, you know, that benefits the whole movement. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And we're getting glimmers of what psilocybin can do for people um, with Canada Special Access Program, which you know about. Um, so that's the um, exemption for people to use psilocybin for um, really severe cases of PTSD um, and end of life care as well, which has just been remarkable to see um, the healing that has come from this form of therapy for these specific people. Um, 
it, it's really beautiful and awesome that we're able to do it. And hopefully the more people that find benefit in, in the special access program, um, the more it'll help kind of normalize and therefore legalize um, this form of therapy. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we talked about Amsterdam a little bit, um, but I do want to hear about Jamaica, which any of you watching, we posted um, a little video of our Jamaica lab today just to kind of show what's going on. It's a really quick clip, but it's really awesome and fascinating stuff. And it's, um, we don't really talk about it much. So I'm excited to talk about it. Marshall's on the ground there a lot. And um, it's cool what we're doing there. So uh, tell us what, what you're doing and what the team is doing down there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love my team in Jamaica. So they're doing a lot of hard work growing up a bunch of different psychoactive species. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's one species that that most people cultivate, and that's Psilocybe cubensis. And mm -hmm. we're interested in exploring the, the spectrum of species that produce psilocybin. So going well beyond cubensis and looking at the 100 plus other species that are producing psilocybin. So we're growing them up in a variety of different formats. And we're breaking them down to analyze their, their chemical composition, seeing how it varies between different species, what interesting molecules are produced um, by these different species, and at what stages of growth they're produced. And so, yeah, every day we're just we're, we're growing up different, um, different mushrooms, and it's really exciting to see and really happy that, that the team is so into it. Mycology is kind of a new frontier for Jamaica like they don't mm -hmm. use mushrooms in most of their cuisine at all um, oh really kind of a, yeah it's kind of a mycophobic culture and huh. so yeah they see them as you know some form of witchcraft or toxic or, or at the very least don't really pay attention to mushrooms yeah but uh but they're really into them like the scientists who are working in the lab are now super into mushrooms and they're seeing mushrooms wow. everywhere on the island and um there's a ton of talent there and not a ton of resources. So I, I feel really um, fortunate that we're able to bring those resources to the island and give people an opportunity yeah. to work in this sort of emerging field. Awesome. Yeah, shout out to the Jamaica team. It looks just so fun and interesting. And I'm really excited to keep highlighting it because like I said, a lot of people don't know what we're doing, but it's it's really interesting work. And my next question in terms of Jamaica is like, do you guys have a North Star with the work you're doing? And like, is there, I mean, is this just going to be ongoing research? And um, what are you trying to achieve with the research and the findings? Yeah, so we're trying to achieve a lot of things. I think, like, at a high level, what we realized early on was that there was a lot of focus being put on synthetic psilocybin, so that mm -hmm. psilocybin is a single molecule that's made in a lab. And that's what's being used for all these clinical trials where you see psilocybin having a really profound effect on depression um, and other conditions. But in reality, most people who are consuming psilocybin, they don't have access to the synthetic. They're actually getting mushrooms um, or some form of the, the fungus from someone else and, and consuming mm -hmm. that whole organism. And with the whole organism comes a huge number of chemicals. Now we're not just talking about one isolated molecule. We're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of different molecules, many of which are probably bioactive at some level. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're trying to understand all those different molecules that these organisms are producing them. And we're also looking at it from not just a, a human effect standpoint, but also like an ecological standpoint to try to understand why they're producing psilocybin in the first place. And we're hoping that mm. understanding the differences between these different psilocybin species and understanding how they grow in the wild and everything will help us to understand why they're producing psilocybin in the first place, which is a pretty exciting academic question. That's incredibly exciting. And without giving anything away that you can't, have you unveiled or discovered anything um, that you guys are excited about so far? Yeah, I'd say one of the things we're really excited about is the fact that, like, when most people think about psilocybin um, mushrooms, they're thinking about, like, the fruiting body, the part of the mushroom that's, you know, above ground. Mm -hmm. But we do a lot of work also with the mycelium. So this is the mm -hmm. underground portion of the mushroom. And we find that different species have different capacities to produce psilocybin and related molecules in this underground portion, um, which... It's generally the majority of the biomass of the organism. So when you see a mushroom 
most of the biomass is actually located underground and you don't see that mm -hmm. but we're able to grow that and analyze that and so we can understand how psilocybin production and production of some of these other molecules differs between the above ground portion and the underground portion and it's pretty interesting to see that some species will produce almost no psilocybin in their mycelium but have high concentrations of it in the mushroom um, and other species have high concentrations in both the mushroom and the mycelium. And we don't know exactly why, but it kind of hints at like an ecological role. Like maybe there's some sort of underground threat that these species that produce it in the mycelium are facing, like an insect that might predate from, mm -hmm. from underground. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things I'm excited about right now and that we're really trying to understand better. That's really cool really cool stuff it's like very mind-blowing <laughs> what you guys are doing um and could any of this research and any of these findings potentially help move along the normalization and or legalization of psilocybin <laughs> hypothetically yeah that's the hope so the hope is that with greater understanding of the organism um, we'd be able to create more rational regulations around any sort of psilocybin market that emerged, or at the very least be able to understand if there are any safety concerns with different mushrooms and how we might avoid those, um, even if there's not a legal market to help benefit, you know, the average consumer who might be taking these. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of hope that this work will actually translate um, beyond the academic realm to these sort of real world applications and help promote mm -hmm. safety um, in, in the industry that's rapidly emerging. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I love that we're doing this here field trip. It's so dang cool. Um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks for doing what you do. We're again, so lucky to have you um, in the team. Um, if there's anything else you want to add, I'm going to go to audience questions, but just in case you had anything else um, interesting to say. Yeah, that sounds good. We can take some questions. Okay. So I gathered some from our Instagram story yesterday, which I'll read those off, but I could go into the chat um, to see if anybody dropped any questions. Um, so uh, Arpert asked yesterday, um, what could the most common misconception be about psilocybin? Hmm, most common misconception, that's a hard one. I think one of the common misconceptions that I've seen is that um, psilocybin is, like when, when people hear the word psilocybin, they immediately think of the mushroom, they don't think of the molecule. Mm. So a lot of people think that all these trials are being done with psilocybin mushrooms, they're not. They're mm. almost all being done with the synthetic molecule in isolation. Interesting. Which is, again, very different from how it's being used in sort of recreational settings. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that's, I think, an important misconception because the organism is not just that molecule. It's, again, far beyond that molecule. So, yeah, yeah we're hoping to understand that better. Love that. Um, okay. Thank you. Vivren Thing <laughs> asks, um, how do you avoid stomach issues when working with psilocybin? Yeah, that's a great question. And not everyone gets stomach issues. And there's also some evidence that it's specific to certain species of mushrooms. It's definitely specific oh. to certain individuals. So some people like, um, especially people who have, you know, mushroom sensitivity, regardless yeah. of whether they're psilocybin mushrooms or not, will always have some sort of gastrointestinal issues most mm -hmm. likely when they consume them um but yeah some species seem more prone to that and especially like there are species that are more potent and so the more potent ones you have to eat less in order to get the effect and so that tends to create less gastrointestinal issues than the ones that are less potent where you have to eat you know three to five grams of the material mm -hmm. to actually get a, a full-blown experience um but beyond that there's there's a good amount of anecdotal evidence that suggests that making a tea can really minimize the, mm -hmm. the nausea and stomach issues that people experience. So if you brew the mushrooms into the tea, um, the psilocybin is heat stable. Um, and so if you brew it and then, you know, drink it within, you know, a couple hours, you should still get a lot of the psilocybin and psilocin that's in there and minimize some of the nausea that might come from the other components that'll stay behind. 
Great. Okay. And I assume that in Amsterdam, when we are working with um, mushrooms for therapeutic purposes, we administer some sort of anti-nausea when necessary. Uh, if needed, yeah. If someone's having a severely, you know, nauseous reaction, it's really rare that someone has like a terrible reaction. Generally, it's a mild amount of nausea. Mm -hmm. um, and some people will even find that therapeutic in certain instances, like they're, they're combating something like sometimes something that you're dealing with psychologically, as we all know, can manifest itself physically. So, yeah. you know, like butterflies in your stomach and those sorts of reactions, those yeah. are perfectly normal. So, um, I think we shouldn't totally shy away from physical um, discomfort, mm. but definitely in cases where it's, it's so bad that it's taking away from the experience altogether. Yeah. There's, there's certain things that can be administered, but preferably not. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, next. Uh, we kind of covered this, but uh, Kylie Shaw asks any news of when it could become legal here in the States and as you mentioned, January for Oregon, hopefully. Um, any other news? Yeah, I mean, I know there are efforts being made to legalize it in California, and I'm sure there are other states that are considering it, but I have no sense of a, a timeline for those sorts of initiatives. But hopefully if Oregon goes well, I mean, I think we'll see over this next year or two how things pan out in Oregon, and if there are no serious safety issues and people are having these really beneficial experiences i think we'll quickly see other states jump on board yeah. i'd say i mean i wouldn't be surprised if within the next five years multiple states join that list yeah hopefully it's like somewhat of a snowball effect right yeah, <laughs> ideally yeah. um awesome um yaya toro asks is psilocybin good for adhd and then my personal question on the heels of that is, is there any other uh, mental health conditions that uh, psilocybin is being studied to treat? Yeah, so there are a lot that are like the, the primary condition I think that's received the most attention is depression, major depressive mm -hmm. disorder and treatment resistant depression. Um, and and those it's shown tremendous promise. And there are a lot of disorders that are related to that uh, to those sorts of disorders, and that includes addiction disorders, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD. They all sort of involve this ruminative thinking where there are thought patterns that are, you know, circling over and over. And if you can escape that and branch out from those destructive thought patterns, you can have a, um, a sort of beneficial outcome from these psychedelic experiences. And so, yeah, there are a lot of disorders that are being explored. ADHD is a really interesting one. I know there's a group that's trying to explore low doses of LSD to treat mm. ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how successful that's been. The idea is that LSD actually has some stimulatory effects on dopamine receptors and the ADHD meds that are currently prescribed also have um, that sort of stimulation of dopamine receptors. And so if you can hijack that with LSD plus having mm. maybe additional beneficial effects from the serotonin receptor agonism, you might actually get a better outcome. And LSD isn't addictive like the existing drugs for ADHD are. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's still an open question whether psychedelics are effective. And I think a lot of it's going to come down to dose too, because yeah. obviously if you're trying to treat something with a daily medication, maybe taking a high dose of psilocybin isn't so helpful. Mm -hmm. um, maybe lower doses will be more helpful, but it, remains to be seen interesting so if if and when psilocybin uh for therapeutic purposes becomes legal are there any reasons other than just personal preference why somebody would want to go with psilocybin over something like ketamine like a field trip offered both um would there be like a logical reason why somebody might be well suited for psilocybin versus ketamine or vice versa? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I think like one of the primary reasons is just going to come down to preference. So like a lot of mm -hmm. people will prefer the, um, this, this molecule that's been made by organisms that has existed mm -hmm. in, in nature for tens of millions of years versus ketamine, yeah. which has been around for less than a century, you know? Mm -hmm. And so 
there's going to be that sort of preference that a lot of people are going to have, and we'll absolutely be able to cater to that preference. Um, some people will prefer ketamine because it's a much shorter experience, and so if if you're not up for a six to eight hour experience, or yeah. if it's less costly to have this shorter experience, ketamine might prove to be better in those cases. And then finally, I think um, because they have these different mechanisms of action, like some people are going to be way more responsive to molecules that act on serotonin receptors like psilocybin, like LSD, like DMT. Um, and some people are going to be more responsive to molecules that act on mm -hmm. glutamate receptors like ketamine. And sure. so depending on, you know, genetic variation, there there will be a preference there for sure. Hopefully we get to the point where we can just take a, a blood sample, do a genetic test, or even a cheek swab, you know, do a genetic test and tell mm -hmm. you this drug would be better for you than that drug because of your particular genetic makeup. Um, but we're not quite there yet, but I know there's a lot of, a lot of people who are working on that sort of cool. field. So that'll be interesting to see. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Okay. And good to know for the future, right? I love that. Um, okay. Uh, we just have a few more minutes. I'm just browsing through the questions here. Thanks to everybody um, who sent in their questions. We covered a lot of this. Um, Okay, somebody asked, Austin asked, does taking a thousand milligram mushroom dose weekly have a negative effect on the brain? I just want to make sure I'm not overdoing it. Yeah, I mean, that's like, a, that's an important open question because when they're administering psilocybin in clinical trials, you know, it's not given weekly. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's possible that the more frequent dosing, like generally with any drug, the more frequent you dose, the more likely you are to have an adverse effect because sure. there are always going to be off target effects of a drug. And if you're taking that over long periods of time on a daily or weekly basis, you're more likely to see some of those off target effects manifest, mm -hmm. but we don't know, like weekly might be okay. And maybe daily is bad or maybe daily is fine. You know, it's like, yeah. they're all open <laughs> questions that are really important. Yeah. to address. Um, one of the issues that people have pointed to is that psilocybin, or psilocin rather, the molecule it's broken down into, does activate this 5-HT2B receptor. So I talked about 5-HT2A, mm -hmm. which is responsible for the psychedelic effect. 5-HT2B um, is found throughout the body, uh, but particularly can induce cardiac valve thickening um, and hardening. Mm -hmm. And so that can pose issues if taken at a high dose really frequently. It hasn't been shown for sure with psilocybin, so it might not be the case for psilocybin, but other drugs that activate that receptor can have that effect. And so that's just something to keep in mind for people who are microdosing you know, daily or very frequently, is that there could be those sorts of off-target effects. And there might not be. I don't want to be alarmist yeah. because it might turn out that like all those effects are moot and these are totally safe drugs to take on a daily basis. Yeah. But generally, we see so much efficacy from the single high dose taken, you know, every few months or even like once a year or even once in a lifetime. Yeah. Um, that those, that tends to be the preference, but there's some yeah. people who would probably benefit from more frequent dosing. For right. Sure. So the answer is we have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Great. That's a, yeah. It's a really important thing. And I think like the more, um, you know, it's like kind of a grand experiment. The more these things get accepted and legalized and decriminalized, the more people that are going to be using them. And those sorts of effects will start to show up yeah. or not show up. And so we'll get some more insights. And hopefully, hopefully they're pretty mild and yeah. we just learn how to avoid them. Yeah, we should uh, set up a little Instagram live on all things microdosing because it's the hot thing right now. And there's a lot of questions around that and, and the protocols and, and what it does for you in the long term. So I'm going to put that in my back pocket. We should do that soon, Marshall. <laughs> um, okay, one more question, because I, I really like this one. And this is Ida Lovelace Music asks, do you feel like there is a long term lasting effect with ketamine versus all of the other ones? So I guess the long term lasting effects of psilocybin versus um, ketamine what that looks like 
Yeah, I think they can both have incredibly long lasting effects depending on the context. And so one of the issues with ketamine and how it was originally explored for depression was that it was explored at a low dose without any psychotherapy. And when mm -hmm. given at a low dose with no psychotherapy, we know it has really profound antidepressant effects, but those effects only tend to last about a week. Okay. Um, and so you think, okay, maybe ketamine's not that effective, but really if you give a higher dose and induce this psychedelic experience and really put a lot of context around the experience and then follow it up with psychotherapy, Mm -hmm. then you can get much more lasting effects. And we're starting to collect that data from our clinic. But what we see is that there's definitely lasting effects from this high dose of ketamine paired with psychotherapy um, that you don't see when you don't have the psychotherapy and you're giving a lower dose. And so I think with both ketamine and psilocybin, you can get really long lasting effects. Like for both drugs, you can get this experience that you know, once in a lifetime type experience comparable to like the birth of a child or the death of a loved one in terms of its emotional intensity. That's true for both drugs and, and that can last a lifetime, you know. So if you are taking it in the appropriate context with um, the appropriate intention, I think you can definitely get hugely lasting effects from, from both those molecules, psilocybin and ketamine. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you for taking all of these questions. And thanks again to everybody who submitted. Um, I think we can wrap up. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Marshall, you are the best. Thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge and everything you're doing for us. We're so grateful to have you um, and really excited to see where we're going with everything. And for those of you who may have just joined or joined a little bit late, there's a lot that we're doing um, with psilocybin and mushrooms here at Field Trip. Um, we have our Amsterdam clinic. We have our wonderful Jamaica lab, which Marshall is on the ground at. Um, we're working with special access program, which there's a very incredible piece um, going up about one of our special access program clients tonight. So stay tuned for that. Um, and you could read all about this on our website. Uh, specifically fieldtriphealth.com slash learn. There's a psilocybin 101 section there where you can learn about Jamaica, you can learn about Amsterdam, um, special access program. And yeah, we're really excited. And we're just gonna, again, keep on carrying that torch alongside so many other people really in great company when it comes to, you know, everybody that sees uh, these molecules as medicines. And I think we're headed in the right direction. Awesome. Okay, well, thanks again, Marshall, for your time. I appreciate it so, so much. And thanks for all joined. And we'll talk soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Macy. Bye. Take care.